So today, um, my, my goal for our time together is just to go over some of the basics of airway stenosis um, and then talk a little bit about the mainstays of endoscopic intervention and then laryngotracheal reconstruction. So those are the sort of the two um, main ways to manage airway uh, stenosis in children. And there is so much that we could talk about. So certainly if there are questions that come up, um, I can't cover all of it in one talk, um, but would be more than happy to come back at, a, at another time to go over additional things. So this is just a snapshot um, of, of the airway experience here in Cincinnati. And I know the numbers are a little bit hard to read, but they go back to the, the 1970s on, on the one end and up to, um, they're not, it's not quite current. Um, it ends about two years ago. It hasn't been updated uh, in the last year or so. Um, but you can see we do we do a, a fair bit of open airway surgery with laryngotracheoplasty being the primary modality that we use, although we certainly do uh, do um, slides uh, in cricotracheal resections as well. So we'll talk just about a couple of the big concepts of airway surgery. And one of them, um, one of the big concepts that we always have to think about is, you know, how do you decide between endoscopic and open? How do you make that decision? Um, about what is the best option for your patient. And um, really reframing the question, it's not, not so much when should you do an open procedure, but when should you not do an endoscopic procedure? Um, and I, the principle behind this is really the, the idea of do no harm. The nice thing about most endoscopic procedures is that there's less risk. You're not burning any bridges um, and you can always then convert to an open procedure at some point down the road if you need to. Um, so by balloon dilation for, for pediatric airway stenosis is really one of the mainstays of endoscopic intervention um, for, for stenosis. Um, but to do it adequately and get a good result, you have to have an adequate laryngotracheal exoskeleton. And we'll talk a little bit about that in, more in a minute. Um, and so if you're going to go endoscopic, you know, a couple of the things you really want to consider are the nature of the scar. What type of scar is it? The thin or young scar tends to respond uh, best to this sort of intervention. Then we'll look at um, concept two, which is open airway surgery, right? And there are really three, when you think about open airway surgery, there are really three main options. You've got augmentation grafting. So you're going to expand the existing um, framework of the airway. You can resect the bad bits, um, or you can do a slide tracheoplay. Um, and today we're really just going to focus, if we're in the interest of time, on, on augmentation grafting um, and look at that. And then the third big concept, whenever you're dealing with airway stenosis, is you really have to think before you act. Um, especially if you're going to be doing open surgery, you need to have a very uh, comprehensive preoperative evaluation and really optimize the patient. Airway surgery is challenging, it can be risky, um, and that's especially true if you're dealing with revision surgery. And so making sure you have um, optimized everything prior to embarking on a big procedure um, is going to give you the best outcomes. And so that involves um, not just evaluating the airway, but evaluating the entire patient and making sure that all of, all of the relevant uh, conditions are, are dealt with before uh, doing a big surgery. So the first step in any airway surgery is, is that initial evaluation. Um, and this is usually, we typically do this as a team activity. Oftentimes, um, they'll get a flexible bronchoscopy by pulmonary as well as um, an EGD by our, our GI uh, colleagues. Um, but when we do our rigid endoscopy, um, it's Im important to really carefully evaluate the stenosis. Now, for the most part, we do these with just a, with just a Hopkin ro Hopkins rod telescope. Um, and this picture is uh, clearly taken pre-COVID since the masks are not on, on everyone in the picture. Um, but you always want to have an appropriate bronch ventilating bronchoscope available just in case you need that uh, to rescue an airway. And this is where you're going to do your very careful evaluation of the stenosis. So you're not only looking at, at the characteristics of the stenosis, how thick is it, how long is it, what, what adjacent sites are involved, does it involve the vocal cords, if not, how far is it from the vocal cords, um, and what other secondary airway lesions um, are present. Um, you want to be able to assess vocal cord mobility, um, and you want to look for other, other areas of possible stenosis. So is there posterior glottic stenosis? Are there problems at the level of the stoma if it's a child with a trach? Um, is there tracheomalacia? All of those other, other issues which can impact the ultimate outcome of the surgery. 
One big component of it is sizing the airway. This is where we determine um, the grade of the stenosis, which helps us think about which approach we're going to use. Um, so to size the airway, we utilize endotracheal tubes. And the correct size of the airway um, is the endotracheal tube that has a leak at less than 20 centimeters of water pressure in the subglottis. We typically will start with a small tube and work our way up um, until we, we have a tube in that, that no longer has a leak. Um, and it's from that sizing that you can then determine the grade of stenosis. Uh, so this is a depiction of the Meyer Cotton uh, grading scale. Um, you can see grade one through four there, both the, the cartoon depiction, but also um, pictures of what that looks like, um, what that looks like in the actual airway. And the, the grade of stenosis is relevant as we think about how, again, how what surgical approach we're going to use. So we used to all, when, when I was a fellow, that picture on the last uh, page, we used to have a laminated card that we all carried around in our pockets and it had, had the, the different um, grades of stenosis and the corresponding sizes. Um, and now that, now that we all walk around with a, a little mini computer in our hands all the time, um, we've actually uh, here in Cincinnati developed an app, which is uh, freely free uh, and widely available both for Apple uh, phones, but also I think for Samsung's now. Um, and it's called the Airway Card. So if you go and search in the App Store for Airway Card, it comes up and you can download it. Um, and it's an interactive um, app that lets you, it ha has a lot of information, um, but it, it will help you grade a stenosis, um, determine the percentage of obstruction in the grade. Um, it has information about uh, tracheostomy tube sizing as well as um, uh, balloon sizing and how to pick the appropriate size balloon. So it's a, it's a handy little cheat sheet um, that everyone is welcome to avail themselves of. So when we think about endoscopic intervention, we'll talk a little bit more about that framework concept that I mentioned at the beginning. So to really effectively treat a stenosis endoscopically, uh, you have to have an intact framework. So what does that mean? It means that the cartilage structure of the airway is present and it is, it, it is adequate. And that the scar you're looking at um, or the obstruction you're looking at is really primarily within the lumen of the trachea or the subglottis. If that is the case, then you have the option of going endoscopic or open. In patients where the framework is inadequate, where you're either missing cartilage or the cartilage is weak, broken down, collapsing, those patients, you can dilate all you want um, and you may temporarily open things up, but without adequate framework support, it's going to re or recollapse. Uh, and ultimately, those patients require open surgery to recreate the framework. And I think it's an important way to think about it as you're trying to decide, can I, can I get away do, doing this procedure endoscopically? So balloon dilation is really the mainstay of, of endoscopic intervention. Um, there are a bazillion other things you can do endoscopically, but today we'll just focus on this. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it done or don't have much experience, um, the, the way we perform it here in Cincinnati is um, you endoscopically place the balloon. Um, you, you visualize it being spanning the, the stenosis that you're trying to dilate. Um, we typically just do this under direct visualization with, with the telescope, but sometimes it'll be done either through the side port of the ventilating bronchoscope or a tracheoscope. You always wanna make sure your patient is pre-oxygenated because you're about to completely obstruct the airway. And then we will typically give them a bolus of propofol because it's very stimulating to have your airway dilated. Um, the balloon is then inflated uh, to the rated burst pressure. Um, and we, if, if the child tolerates it, we'll keep the balloon inflated for two minutes um, or until the oxygen saturation starts to drop below 90. At that point, you def deflate the balloon and you remove it and you look and, uh, look and see if you were effective. So how do you figure out what size balloon to use? Well, you can either cheat and use that app um, or your, what you do is, is the formula that was developed is to take the outer diameter of the age-appropriate endotracheal tube. If you're dilating at the level of the larynx, you add one millimeter. If you're dilating in the subglottis of the trachea, you add two millimeters. So for example, you, if you have a four-year-old child, um, you should be able to intubate that child with a 5 endotracheal tube. Uh, the outer diameter of a 5 tube is 6.8 millimeters. We round that to seven. And so if you're going to dilate the larynx, you're going to use an eight millimeter balloon. And if you're dilating the subglottis of the trachea, you would use a nine millimeter. Uh, balloon. So we typically, if we are going the route of trying to manage um, a stenosis endoscopically, we'll dilate at either seven to 14 day intervals. 
typically around three to four times. Um, because each time you do it, you lose a little bit of uh, you lose a little bit of ground, and oftentimes then um, have to have to redilate to really keep a nice patent lumen. Typically, either at the second dilation or after the second dilation, we'll consider injecting some steroid um, or doing some adjuvant um, scarbian division uh, or removal um, if we're not making the progress that we're hoping to see. And when when it comes down to it, if you've done full, you know four or five dilations, and it's really, you're not getting anywhere. Um, at that point, it, you have to acknowledge that dilation alone isn't going to be sufficient, um, and you would have to consider uh, other options in order to achieve the airway that you're trying to achieve. So this is just an example of where balloon dilation was a, a really helpful uh, approach. So this is a six-year-old female who presented to clinic um, with strider and dyspnea on exertion. Uh, about a month prior to presentation, she had been intubated for three days after a fall that required surgical repair of a broken arm. Um, she had she was taken to the operating room uh, and endoscopy was performed and she had a grade three tracheal stenosis. She had a very, very small airway, which you could see in the video there. So she had two dilations that day initially with an 8.5 millimeter balloon because the stenosis was so small and then a 10 millimeter balloon. And you can see that, that the airway she achieved um, with just dilation was quite adequate. Adequate. Um, the key things there in that video that you'll see as, as it played was that the scarbian, it was a very short segment of stenosis. It was a relatively fresh stenosis. Her intubation um, had been only about a month or so before that, um, and, it was, and it was very thin. So she came back, with, she had a couple of serial interventions. So she came back at two week intervals. Um, and then this is just for the sake of time. Um, this is what, that's what her airway looked like four months after the very initial intervention. So at that point, she did have a little bit of a scar band, um, but she easily accommodated a 5.0 endotracheal tube, which leaked freely, and she was asymptomatic. So this is a patient where early on, um, I, we would have considered doing a big tracheal resection. Um, and in the end, we got away with a handful of endoscopic interventions um, and saved her a really big procedure, uh, but with a, with a good outcome. So now we'll transition uh, to uh, laryngotracheal reconstruction and spend some time here. Um, as this is where, where we, this is again, one of our primary open interventions um, that we use here in Cincinnati. So we'll talk a little bit about graft materials, um, the different uh, techniques involved, um, anterior posterior grafting um, and the differences between them. So when you think about augmentation grafting, the aim of the procedure is to expand the laryngotracheal exoskeleton. So you're not just, you're not just addressing that intraluminal scar like we are with, with an endoscopic procedure, you're actually taking the external part of the trachea or the subglottis and making it bigger. You can use pretty much any sort of cartilage. Um, in some instances, you can use pericardium or a homograft, although those are, are very uncommonly used. Um, and you can put your graft either in the anterior cricoid, anterior airway, the posterior cricoid, both places, uh, and again, rarely uh, pericardial patches. So the nice thing about LTR is that it's really a two-dimensional operation. And because it's a two-dimensional operation, the outcome is less dependent on the surgeon. So compared to something like a cricotracheal resection, which is um, a much more three-dimensional operation where you have to get all the parts to fit together properly uh, to achieve an optimal outcome, um, a LTR is a little bit more straightforward. The outcome of LTR is primarily related to the grade of stenosis. It's been looked at at multiple centers in multiple ways, and usually the grade of stenosis is the primary indicator. So the higher the grade of stenosis, the less likely you are to achieve uh, a, a good outcome. There are some things that, that can negatively influence outcomes. So things like active larynx, reflux, eosinophilic esophag esophagitis, infection or colonization with uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus, and patients who are undergoing revision, revision surgery. So all of those factors are, are part of that preoperative pre optimization that we talked about briefly at the beginning is making sure that if any of these things exist, that they are adequately treated and managed before you embark on the open surgery. Um, depending on uh, the various factors involved, success of LTR it can range anywhere from 50 to 90 percent. Again, with the, the higher grade stenosis, the revision surgeries being, being on the lower end of that, uh, and the uh, more straightforward grade two stenoses 
um, being on that higher end where you're at more at a 90% success rate. So grafted materials, um, you can pretty much use any sort of cartilage. Costal cartilage from the rib is the most common and you can watch that little animation there of how it's harvested. Um, this, is, this is what we use most frequently. Um, it is the right size, it's the most durable, um, and that is why it's most commonly used. Thyroid ALA um, has, has a role in smaller children um, as, as your primary cartilage, um, but as kids get older, there's less of a role for this. And then in some rare instances, auricular cartilage can be used. Um, as you can imagine, that's not quite as, it's not quite as thick or as hardy, so it is not as, as useful. And then you can see a few other, um, a few other options listed there um, that have all been used, although they are not typically on the uh, primary go-to. So when we think about um, LTR, it can be done either as a single stage procedure or as a double stage procedure. And a single stage procedure is where you have a child who either had no trach to begin with, who leaves the operating room without a trach, um, or a patient who comes in with a tracheostomy tube, but leaves uh, without one. Uh, and that's what we mean by single stage. So the indications for this, this is when you're doing the simple surgery. So the more straightforward, low, low grade stenosis, um, oftentimes we'll think of this as in an older child, um, or if there's a problem with the stoma. So if the stoma is one of the main areas of obstruction, it's much easier to address that uh, in a single stage fashion and get the trach tube out at the time of surgery um, than it is to, to have to either recite the trach or um, have it still um, in place as you're trying to graft all the way down uh, to the stoma. Um, it's not limited to subglottic stenosis, uh, but it is uh, particularly useful for the lower grade subglottic stenosis. So there are certainly some things that are contraindications for trying to do uh, an LTR as a single stage procedure. So you can see in the picture here, um, this is um, a, a glottis, although it certainly doesn't look like one. Um, and so kids who have multi-level obstruction um, are certainly on this list of contraindication. Um, patients with poor pulmonary reserve, um, so the, the chronic lung disease babies who don't, who desaturate very, very quickly, um, they don't tolerate being intubated for the single stage um, uh, portion of the procedure. Um, the high grade three or a grade four stenosis, um, they generally speaking have, have lower success. So doing it as a single stage procedure is a bit riskier. Okay, so multi-level stenosis. Um, patients who've had multiple revisions, they typically don't lend themselves well to a single stage approach. Or patients who've had trouble uh, with sedation in the past because these kids have to stay intubated postoperatively. Um, also, if they're really difficult to reintubate, it certainly would give you pause. And then the final um, big contraindication or something that would at least get, you would want to consider is if you've got an inexperienced ICU. Um, the success of these single stage procedures is very much, at least here, um, dependent on, on our ICU's management because they manage uh, the ventilator, they manage the sedation, um, all of those things. And so if you have an ICU that's not comfortable with these kids and these procedures, it doesn't, it can, it's a recipe for it to not go well. So you can see here, um, it, typically kids over the age of three don't need to be sedated, even when they're nasotracheally intubated. This is a little bit younger child who tolerated having a tube in his, in his airway without any difficulty. Um, and, and our older kids will oftentimes be up and out of bed and walking around and it freaks people out to see a kid making laps in the ICU with, with their endotracheal tube in place. Um, but they do much better if they can be um, minimally sedated like that. The younger kids, um, kids who were former premature infants, they're much more likely to need sedation and oftentimes lots of it because they've been exposed to much more. Um, and so that it can make their management a little bit tricky. We prefer whenever possible to avoid paralysis um, because it has a lot of uh, complications that can come along with it. So when we think about the role for anterior grafting alone, and then this is again, independent of whether you're doing it as a single stage or double stage procedure, um, sort of the ideal circumstance where you're only going to place an anterior graft is if you've got a pretty low grade, like a grade two subglottic stenosis, and it's really in, uh, isolated to the anterior part of the subglottis. Very rarely um, is an anterior graft alone sufficient for a grade three, um, but it also has a role for those patients who have uh, superstomal collapse um, that is, is um, preventing the trach from coming out. 
Um, and when you're doing an anterior cartilage uh, graft alone, um, you can either do this as a single stage or oftentimes without a, you can get away without a stent because this, the graft is sutured in place. So this is a nice little animation of um, how the, the key steps involved in um, doing an anterior graft. Um, and be, before you begin any of these procedures, we always start with airway endoscopy just to confirm that uh, everything um, is a go and that there aren't any surprises. And then with an anterior graft, it's a fairly straightforward procedure. You divide the anterior cricoid, a little bit of the, the proximal trachea, and a little bit up into the thyroid cartilage, keeping in mind that the younger the child, the lower their vocal cords are going to be. So just doing that part with care. You harvest the rib and then uh, leaving the, the perichondrium down uh, in the chest. Um, and then you carve it so that the perichondrial side is going to be facing the lumen and we carve it into that sort of classic boat shape uh, that uh, we pre-measured to make sure that we've got the width and the length uh, accurate. And then that gets sutured into place um, and the child um, is uh, either intubated uh, for a short period of time or in some instances extubated. And you can see the difference there between sort of the, the defect before, which is really, you know, a relatively low grade stenosis um, at the anterior part um, and then after it's been repaired. So this is just a cartoon depiction of those same things. Again, um, just, just a different way to visualize it. And you can see um, that boat shape of the, of the cartilage um, and how that sits down into the airway, expanding um, that cricoid car cartilage uh, in the cartilage framework. So this is just a, a patient um, who, who was treated with a single stage um, anterior graft alone, and they had a pretty isolated, low-grade um, subglottic stenosis. And you can see in the follow-up video, you, you just sort of zoom right past uh, the cartilage there, um, but it's integrated uh, nicely into the airway. And um, although certainly there's still some, a little bit of narrowing, they have an adequate airway now. So posterior cricoid grafting, um, this, is an, this is a technique that's really evolved over time. Um, it used to be that we always sutured these grafts into place. And if you've ever done that, it's a, it's a really fiddly, uh, difficult thing to do. Um, and it turns out that back in 1998 is the very first time that we did a non-sutured uh, posterior graft. And it just so happened that it was Dr. Cotton's or the institution's thousandth um, laryngotracheal reconstruction. I'm not sure how they managed to get that timing to work out, but it's a, it's a little fun fact. Um, some of the other things as we think about um, posterior grafting, so we always used to stent these kids for a really long time, um, and, and we found that you can get away with a shorter period of time. And then we always used to do in the past do this procedure by doing a complete laryngo fissure. Um, and now whenever possible, we try to avoid that to preserve the anterior commissure. And I'll talk a little bit. So here's a similar video. Um, that goes over the steps of this. And so the primary indications for posterior grafting is again, so if you're doing posterior grafting alone, you've just got a mild stenosis involving the posterior subglottis or more commonly we're doing it for um, posterior glottic stenosis or vocal cord issues. Um, so you, just like with the anterior graft, you harvest your cartilage, you carve it differently. So instead of that boat shape, you make more of a keystone shape um, and again, you want the perichondrial side is the part that's going to be intraluminal. The, the front part of the airway is split just like it would be for an anterior graft. You divide that posterior cricoid plate um, and then snap the graft into place um, without suturing it. And we'll look a little bit more at the steps of this here. And then you, you sew the front up. Now, certainly you can also put an anterior graft in um, at, that, at that point before you suture. So, Again, the before and the after, and the, the big difference there is the, the increased um, lumen um, at the posterior part of the glottis. So when we think about, about um, the posterior graft, like I said a minute ago, we almost always used to do a complete laryngo fissure. Um, and you can see in that top video, so that is a complete laryngo fissure being performed. And if you do this, um, you have to do it very, very cautiously. Um, to avoid injury to the vocal cords and to really divide that commissure right in the middle. So we always will do it um, with endoscopic guidance like that. And you can see in the bottom video, um, especially as it's, it goes back to the start, when you don't do this properly, you can end up um, with a web. You can see how the vocal cords there, are, the anterior commissure is overlapped. Um, when you do a laryngo fissure, it gives you great access to the posterior glottis. It makes putting the graft in 
much easier. Um, but in the long run, um, it is um, if you can get away without it, it's, it's the ideal approach. So I know that video uh, goes through the steps very quickly. So this is again just a kind of a, car a, a cartoon depiction of how the steps are done. So you divide that anterior uh, cricoid. Um, so you have access to the posterior, um, the posterior cricoid plate. Um, we will always inject, and the advantage of injection injecting is one, it gives you nice hemostasis, but two, it helps push that esophagus a little bit further away. So if you are getting a little aggressive as you divide your posterior cricoid, you're nowhere near the esophagus um, and you're less likely uh, to inadvertently enter it. Um, once you have done that infiltration, you divide that posterior cricoid plate directly in the midline and then create a little bit of a pocket, which you can see there. And we typically actually use ear instruments to do this. We'll use a round knife out of, the, uh, out of our tympanoplasty tray. Um, to create the little pocket that's going to accept the graft. Um, there's the, again the graft being harvested and carved into that keystone shape um, and you can see that that shape is sort of essential. It's really designed to like snap into place in that posterior cricoid plate um, to avoid having to suture it and it's again it's a different shape than how we carve the anterior graft. So there's a picture of the anterior graft just for contrast what that looks like um, and that is um, placed then uh, in the front part of the airway if you're doing both. And this is just a somewhat blurry still picture um, looking directly at a glottis and you can see how the posterior glottis, the cords are really close together. Um, in fact, closer together than, uh, than they are anteriorly. This is the same, um, the same glottis with, with the graft after, right after it's been placed and you can see how you get really nice distraction um, of the vocal cords of the, of the posterior aspect there. So when we think about stenting, you can either not stent, um, like we talked about with single stages, you can either extubate right away, depending on the type of graft you've placed, or you can leave them intubated uh, for a period of time uh, using an endotracheal tube. Um, if you're doing a double stage procedure, um, you can either leave a T-tube in place or use the suprastomal stent. Um, and then the picture below is the um, typical suprastomal stent that we use when we do a double stage procedure. So, um, when we think about, when we do stent these, um, regardless of the stent type, well, we always use what's called quad therapy and I'll show you on the next slide what that entails. Um, and we do a, a endoscopy a week after the stent comes out. And the reason for that, as you can see in those videos, play them again, is this is actually, that top video is um, a, a patient a week after the stent was removed and there's so much granulation tissue, it's effectively a grade four stenosis. Um, and so the, the appearance on the day the stent is removed is not so relevant. It really matters what it looks like um, a week later, um, which is why we always do that, that one week follow-up scope. Um, so quad therapy um, are the medications listed here. We use a combination of four of them. Ciprodex, which is um, uh, ciprofloxacin dexamethasone um, eardrop, but we use it down the tracheostomy tube. Uh, augmentin or amox uh, um, amoxicillin clavulonic acid. Um, dexamethasone um, given orally or via G-tube, and then a proton pump inhibitor, which they actually remain on uh, for six months postoperatively. Um, and we will do this right around the time of stent removal to help minimize that granulation tissue. The question of how long to stent, so we did a study um, a couple years ago looking at a group of patients, and it's a smaller number of patients because we're really trying to make them very homogenous. Um, and a portion of them were stented for sh uh, short-term period. Period, um, which was less than 21 days versus a long-term period, which was greater than 21 days, but averaged between about four to six weeks. And you can see um, that um, the big difference is that the patients who um, were stented for a shorter period of time had a much lower rate of decumulate. Um, so it, it, in our experience, we find that, that stenting um, somewhere in that four to six week range um, is probably optimal um, and it, it, it gives a better outcome. So LTR overall, um, it is really, it's probably one of the most established um, methods uh, for surgically managing um, uh, laryngotracheal stenosis. Um, the success uh, rate is, is really correlated with degree of stenosis with the increase, so the higher your stenosis, um, the less likely you are to be successful. Um, but with the lower grade stenosis, success is upwards of 90, right around that 85 to 90%. So a very effective approach um, in that, you know, the, the, when you when endoscopic isn't an option, LTR um, is a great uh, next option, especially if you're 
um, a newer airway surgeon starting out, um, it's a great, a great way to uh, get some experience working in the airway. Um, I was interested, you, you talked obviously about the way that you choose um, the right size balloon for the child. And, and as you were talking about that, I was thinking of a couple of cases we've had recently where it's been a very tight stenosis and we've obviously felt maybe we shouldn't start with the correct size for that child. And then I think you did mention in, a, in one case where you'd started slightly small. So I, I guess you almost answered that question, but do you sometimes do that if it's quite tight, you start slightly smaller and then go up slightly gradually? Absolutely. So if you have a really small stenosis, it's, you know, you can start with a very small balloon, create a lumen, um, and then, um, then go ahead and use a bigger balloon. Um, in some instances, so like that case, that child was not intubatable. The stenosis was small enough, and endotracheal tube wouldn't fit through, and and that's where just a small balloon, and oftentimes with that initial dilation, then you can put the balloon in, inflate it, it will open up that scar band enough that you can then intubate, and then really pre-oxygenate and use the appropriate size balloon to be able to achieve an adequate dilation. But if you've got a child with such a small stenosis and you're trying to do that pre-oxygenation bit. Yeah. They're not very little of that oxygen is sneaking through that itty bitty that itty bitty opening, and so you do the dilation more as a rescue to to achieve some patency of the tracheal lumen, which allows you to then intubate or to more effectively mask and actually ventilate the child, and then and then up the size of the balloon to get the the appropriate uh, size. Well, no, thank you. And the other question I had is um, uh, again on the balloon dilation side is I think we sometimes struggle to bring children in at quite that interval and I just wondered how as a team you'd come to the decision that repeating it every one to two weeks three or four times was kind of the right time frame and, and whether that's something we really should try and push towards doing it that frequently. Right so it's a great question um, and there's not really great you know there's not really great evidence necessarily to back back it up. And so a lot of, a lot of um, really most of the work to this point with, with balloons um, has been um, based on expert opinion um, and sort of accumulative um, evidence. And we do, we do quite a lot of balloon dilation in, in a variety of settings um, here. So sometimes it's in that setting for like as the primary management, but we'll use it a lot um, uh, after an LTR um, if they're starting to re you know, re um, so I think those timeframes really just developed out of experience where, where we found that if you go too far, you lose enough ground in between dilations that you, you can't get out ahead of that scar band. Um, and, and that's why doing it on you know, slightly smaller intervals. Now there are some patients where you dilate it, they come back a week later and it is completely restenosed. Um, and those oftentimes you recognize very early on that, that dilation is perhaps not going to be effective. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions that, that sort of fit into this part of the conversation. I have the chat up. Um, so this, the role of steroid injection, um, the thought behind that is that it, it helps decrease uh, some of the some of the scarring um, reoccurring. Um, we will also sometimes use inhaled Ciprodex um, if patients are developing a lot of granulation tissue at that scar. Um, but the thought there is that that the the steroid um, helps helps keep the scar from maturing um, and helps helps you kind of stay out ahead of it. Um, again, not necessarily great evidence for it. Um, a lot of that is, is based on expert opinion, although um, certainly both our center and other centers have, have been trying to study this. Um, and some of these things we have been able to delineate in small groups of, of um, New Zealand white rabbits and actually looking at specifically those questions like you asked, like what is the ideal interval? What happens if you wait longer? Um, and that's of course in rabbits, which are not quite the same, um, but it, it is starting to, to kind of provide a little bit of evidence to support the clinical experience that we've had. Um, I think there was also a question about mitomycin C um, that, that popped up um, at one point. So again, um, so mitomycin C, you know, depending on the, the literature you read, in some studies it's very helpful, in some studies it's not. Um, I know we had a handful of patients in this, to be quite honest, was before my time here. Um, and mitomycin C, I've, I've never seen it used in an airway. 
Um, it was just not common practice um, by the, already by the time I started my fellowship, um, which was, was here in Cincinnati. Um, it, I, you know, there is some evidence that it helps. It's the same, the same principle, right? So the, it's interfering with, with the formation of the scar tissue, um, but it can also, um, it can also go the opposite direction and, and create, um, can create some additional damage. And I think if it's used uh, too aggressively, that has been the case. And I think that was part of the reason that it was, uh, that it stopped being used uh, here in Cincinnati is that there were, there were a number of complications with it. Um, which you really don't necessarily see with, with a steroid injection. I'm trying to yeah. keep up here. Yeah, the... I'm trying to help a little bit. Yeah. I think there were a couple of things about the, um, about the average dimension of the graft you use and what suits your material when you're using grafts in an LTR. Sure, so the, the dimensions, we, so we typically will actually measure um, how the size that we need. Um, so for a posterior graft, measuring, you're really more measuring the length on that. Um, and for a posterior graft, it depends a little bit more on the age of the child. Um, so it's usually going to be somewhere between about three and five millimeters. Obviously, the bigger you go, the, the in, improved patency you will have of the airway, but then you also uh, start to, it really dramatically increase the risk of aspiration uh, by, by over expanding that posterior glottis. So usually five millimeters is about the max um, that, we will, that we will go. Um, and so most commonly, um, those, the posterior graft ends up being about four, four millimeters wide, the part that the intraluminal part. Um, for an anterior graft, um, it's really going to, to depend um, on the stenosis. Um, and so we will, we will use calipers intraoperatively uh, to measure. Um, and oftentimes we'll take an endotracheal tube and cut it um, and put it into the lumen um, and, and then measure with that in place to see how much expansion we need. So that's, that's one where we will typically measure. And then the nice thing about doing that is it also then helps you um, as you're harvesting your rib, you, can, you know the dimensions and primarily the length um, so that if you are doing both anterior and posterior grafts, you can ensure that by harvesting only one rib, what you'll have sufficient length. Um, suture, we typically uh, suture, we, we use PDS um, here primarily. Um, I have seen um, places where they use Vicryl to suture in a graft, um, but PDS is typically what, what we will use. I think they asked whether you use any tissue glue as well or just sutures, Catherine. So we do use tissue glue um, over the anterior graft. Um, we don't use any tissue glue, obviously, within the lumen of the trachea. Um, but once the anterior graft is sutured in place, we will use um, a, a fibrin glue. Um, I, we do use that with some caution. Um, sometimes the over exuberant fellows will just, you know, take it um, in much like a craft project and just fill the whole anterior neck with the glue. Um, but you want to keep in mind that you are requiring or you're re relying on the soft tissue and the strap muscles uh, to be to uh, provide blood supply uh, to that. So the thicker your layer of fibrin glue, um, the longer it's going to take and you run some risk then of your of your cartilage starting to necrose. So we really try and limit the fibrin glue to, to, to the edge um, to really seal kind of the crevice between where the, the graft is sitting um, and the tracheal wall rather than a big sheet of it that can interfere with that, that uh, neovascularization. You put drains in, Catherine, as well? We do. So we'll put a, we put um, just a Penrose drain, so just a passive drain in both the chest, uh, the chest incision where we've harvested the rib and into the neck. Um, generally speaking, for an LTR, we will remove the chest drain on postoperative day two and the neck drain on postoperative day three. Um, there are some rare circumstances. Um, if there's any air in the neck, we will leave that chest drain longer, um, obviously. Um, but that 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 is the typical the typical duration of time. And then I think there were a couple of questions just asking you when if you're doing a single stage procedure, um, if you're using a stent, um, how long do you keep that in, and how long do you manage to keep the children sedated with an ET tube in in that situation? <laughs> Usually, if we're going to leave an endotracheal tube in after a single stage procedure, we'll leave it for about a week. Um, and we typically, so we'll leave, we'll leave the child um, nasally intubated. Um, and then after a week, we will do a control endoscopy in the operating room. So we'll, we'll put, take them off, get them off the sleep, remove the endotracheal tube, make sure that the 
grafts are mucosalizing appropriately, and then plan um, to extubate them the following day. Um, oftentimes at that time, when we do that look, we will oftentimes put in a half size smaller endotracheal tube. Um, and that helps, if, especially if there's a bit of edema at the level of the glottis from the tube, um, or if there's a bit of granulation tissue, that, that 24 hours or so with a smaller tube can help offset that a little bit. Um, we'll usually typically only do a single dose of, um, of steroid at that point. Um, again, the, the thought being that if you give too much steroid, you might uh, impede uh, further healing and further integration of that cartilage. Um, and then towards towards the end of it, I think there's one um, just to ask you to clarify slightly the maximum length you would continue with endoscopic treatment. I think you touched on that, but just to... yeah. So usually, um, usually if you find that you've gotten to dilation number four or five and you don't have an adequate airway yet, um, at that point you're not going to achieve an adequate airway and you have to do something different. Whether that is a more aggressive endoscopic procedure. Or, I, or switch to, uh, to an open procedure at that at that point. Um, but if you're if you come back after having done your fourth dilation and you look again and you've restenosed a fair amount, um, that is usually the the point at which you say, okay, it's time to do something different. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And then I think uh, at the end, someone's asked you if you have any experience with tracheal tr transplant in a severely scarred trachea. They've given an example of a post-inhalational injury in an adult that uh, I think they've seen, but any views on, on or experience yes. with that? So it's, it's, I mean, we would all, I think, love for it to be effective. Um, I think, we, you know, we have had a, we've had a few instances where we have used homograft um, trachea, but never a full tracheal transplant. I don't think, I don't think the science is there yet, um, and I, I still think it's it is um, definitely a procedure that is very much in the experimental realm. Um, and so there are, I can't, I, I'm struggling to think of very many pediatric airways where it would, where I would be willing to take that risk. Um, just yet, based on based on on the experience out there, um, I think the tough thing with the pediatric airway, and I know you know in, in some of the things I've read in in the in the adult airways, is it, it's very there's oftentimes um, a lot of granulation tissue, a lot of difficulty getting secretions to clear. Um, in that initial period, can be very very difficult, requiring frequent bronchoscopies. If you're trying to do this in a pediatric airway where the diameter of the lumen is much smaller, I think you you quickly run into area, uh, problems uh, from that standpoint. Um, so, like I said, there have been a couple of times where we we've used homograft in in um, airways that have been repaired but had a dehiscence, uh, and the the trachea itself was just not completely salvageable. Um, but those are um, to use a, a, a football term, those are what we deem Hail Marys, where it's really kind of a last ditch um, effort to try and keep the child alive. And I think Sean just had one right near the beginning that I, I apologize I missed. And I think, again, we don't have quite such a brilliant set that you do to have the kind of triple endoscopy as part of your pre-op workup. And I think he asked, and I was interested in particularly the role of the gastro investigations and, mm -hmm. and where and how much you found esoph uh, eosinoph eosinophilic esophagitis relevant, how, how many, what kind of, is that a predictable thing in a certain group of patients or how often do you come across that? So we, we come across it more often than I think you might anticipate. Um, and so, you know, all of our kids who, I, well, I won't, should, I won't say all, in theory, all of them should, but not quite all of them always make it, get, get it, um, have, have their esophagus evaluated. Now, the kids who have eosinophilic esophagitis that is bad enough um, to potentially influence your outcome on your airway reconstruction, they typically will have an abnormal appearing esophagus. So if you put the scope in um, and they have some of the classic findings of EOE, which is you know the furrowing, sometimes it's exudate, that what they call tracheolization, where the esophagus actually looks like it's got tracheal rings. Um, those are kids you for sure are going to want to biopsy and treat. Um, you know, when we do it, have an EGD done by our GI colleagues, they biopsy um, all of these kids. 
um, in, in look um, for EOE, and they also are looking for esophagitis, which, you know, if, they, if it's just regular old esophagitis, um, then it's really a matter of optimizing reflux management. Um, but we do know that any sort of extensive inflammation of the esophagus can impact how your, your reconstruction heals, which is why we, why we care. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think we should probably give it more attention. It's, we should learn from and that. And certainly it is primarily done by our GI colleagues now. I think in the past, Dr. Cotton um, used to do a lot of it himself. Um, and so he would just use a bio, he would just take small biopsies of the esophagus um, and, and send those um, uh, to pathology to be looked at. Um, so it certainly can be done. Um, I mean, that is well within, I think, the, the skill set of most otolaryngologists um, yeah. to, um, to do esophagoscopy and take those little biopsies. So that, that would be a consideration as well. Absolutely. And I think one of our fellows has just asked a question about uh, uh, what might be the recommended treatment for a, a grade three subglottic stenosis combined with a suprastomal collapse in a patient with a tracheostomy, how you would approach that? Yeah, so that's a, t that's a tough one. If it's a really barely grade three stenosis, you might be able to get away with a single stage on that one. But I think probably more commonly, um, I think I would, I would treat that by doing a double stage procedure. Um, and a little bit of it depends on um, how close the subglottic stenosis is to that suprastomal area. Um, in, some, in, in some kids, the two kind of merge together, um, in which case you have two options. If you're, I would still do it as a double stage, but you can either recite the tracheostomy tube. If, it's, if the trachea is long enough and you have the room, you actually just make a new tracheostomy and move your trach tube down in the neck, and then you can graft through the previous trach site. Mm -hmm. If it's a smaller child, you oftentimes don't have tracheal length to do that, in which case you, I, you sometimes can just simply graft right up to the top part of the stoma. Um, you have to have to secure, make sure that's very secured so that the that distal part of the graft doesn't prolapse in. And then when you stent those, you really wanna make sure that your suprastomal stent gets right up uh, to the edge of the tracheostomy tube, again, to keep that, that distal part of the graft from collapsing in and, and recreating a suprastomal collapse. Um, but I would, I would still probably go double stage on that and, and you just have to, have to either move, move the trach um, or graft right down to the stoma. Or you do it as two, if, it's, if they're separate. So if it's a subglottic stenosis, you have a bit of, of non-stenotic airway and then your suprastomal collapse Sometimes I'll, I'll deal with it as, as two surgeries. It's not as ideal because you're not gonna do two big procedures, um, but it is something you deal with the, the subglottis, get that nice and patent, and then you do the suprastomal part um, as a separate single stage procedure. That's the other way to go about it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's pretty much all those questions. Can I ask you one final one? Because I thought the, the fact that you have obviously a, a related interest in children with tracheostomies and their care and their safety, I just wondered, you, you gave that lovely graph which showed over how many decades that Cincinnati have been treating children with airway stenosis. And I, I, I think the care of tracheostomies and the safety of children and the community care has come on a huge amount over that period. And I wondered if you had a sense that that has changed anything in terms of because the children are safer, do you think we, we can wait longer before we have to tackle these things? Or do you think there's still a real drive to kind of get the tracheostomy out as soon as possible. I just wondered if you had a sense that that has made any difference to your management. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think the big difference is that um, in the past, um, children with tracheostomies, oftentimes, um, especially in those early years, they, we, they couldn't safely be discharged from the hospital. People weren't comfortable with that. And now um, with home health nurses and things with those systems in place, um, I think, um, with improved family education, we're more comfortable with these with with children being outside of the hospital, and that that in and of itself gives us a little bit more um, time. Um, if you can't get the child out of the hospital, then the drive to do something sooner is 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 really compelling. Um, I think there are still patients where trying to get the tracheostomy tube out sooner rather than later is very important. Um, sometimes it's for social reasons. Um, but the patients who have those really high grade three or grade four stenosis, where if the trach tube were to come out or get occluded, 
it can still have devastating um, outcomes um, be because of the, the trach tube. And so in those kids, um, I think there is still a, a good reason to try and do it earlier rather than later. Um, but I, you know, I think with the advancements in, in the safety of trach care at home, um, there, there are a lot of kids where we do sort of say, you know what, let's get you bigger, let's deal with these other issues, and then we're going to come back uh, and, and work on getting the trach tube out. So I, I think it, it has changed things uh, in that regard. Well, thank you. That makes that makes perfect sense. 